people who openly laughed in my face when I suggested that this administration would distribute antiretroviral drugs to Africans. They said, you are out of your tiny mind. There's 200,000 Africans now who owe their lives to America. And is there a secret to your success, the way you've been able to do this? It was probably that it would be really wrong beating a sort of left-wing drum, taking the usual bleeding heart liberal line. Instead, he enlisted the ruling right of American politics. Particularly conservative Christians, I, I was very angry that they were not involved more in the AIDS emergency. I was saying this is the leprosy that we read about in the, in the New Testament. You know, Christ hung out with the lepers, but you're ignoring the AIDS uh, emergency. How can you? And, you know, they said, well, you're right, actually. We have been, and we're sorry. And we'll get involved. And they did. His proudest achievement w may have been helping convince the G8 industrial easy. nations to sign an agreement that will forgive over $40 billion in loans to third world countries, 18 of them so far. And these countries, instead of paying that money, servicing these old debts, can spend it on, you know, health and education and infrastructure in their countries. It's an amazing achievement. But for all of his success as an activist, Bono remains a rock star at the core. He and the rest of the band have vacation homes in the south of France, the epicenter of celebrity lifestyle. How did you end up here? <laughs> I mean, how did you end up in the south of France as opposed to Spain, Italy? There's been always been an Irish French thing going back to what's called the flight of earls and uh, in the 19th century. So um, they're very tolerant of loud Irish people here, as you can see. <laughs> I like to keep a low profile. The fact is, Bono's celebrity profile could hardly be bigger. Very good. Come here, you're there. Rock star sunglasses aside, he dispenses with it as much as possible. I've seen you at a couple of places, not on tour. Right. And you didn't have security around. No. You were just sitting in a restaurant? No. So when you're not on tour, you don't travel with security? No. You don't have a posse? No, I don't have a posse. Am I missing that? <laughs> have you got one? I bet you've got a posse. I don't have a posse. <laughs> I got a crew I travel with. I said posse. <laughs> I just, you know, I've always, you know, our thing in being in YouTube is like, how do you be but not have to have all that bull that goes with being famous and, and, and so answer number one, live in Ireland. Okay, that helped. But okay. we're in South of France. Answer number two, <laughs> live in the South of France. Why live in Fr France? Because the French are so snobbish. The French are so uh, into themselves, they don't even notice you. And truth is Bono and the band are treated like royalty on the French Riviera and spend as much time here as possible. I'm afraid we didn't get much sleep Woo! last night. Yeah. On tour this summer, they commuted to many of their European concerts from here. Their ride, a private jet. The reason we hop out of the south here is because people's families can be based in one place and it's summer holidays, so it means people get to spend more time at home. I mean, we're essentially into the, the simple life. That's, that's the simple, you know, the simple, no nonsense. Where's that champagne? <laughs> Poking fun of themselves is something they do well and often. At the height of their early fame, almost 20 years ago, Frank Sinatra joined in at one of his Las Vegas concerts. During the show, he stood up. Uh, he stopped us and made us kind of stand up and do the wave thing. And we were dressed in, you know, rags, mm. uh, just in comparison with sort of... And he was impeccable. He was impeccable and just stopped. He said, you're number one all around the world. Mm. He said, look at you. You haven't spent a dime on your clothes. <laughs> Today, they do spend millions on their concert production. Every last detail of their sets is state of the art. Cheers. <laughs> even a cappuccino machine under the stage. This is a nice little perk to have back here. I think being on the road, it's the little things that make the difference. Yeah. I mean, that goes for the music, too. At the sound check in Spain, it's evident that this four-piece band gets a lot out of their instruments. 
part of their secret? Guitar technology. It's, it's like a programmable switching system, so I can go through any combination of effects. So if you're playing, for example, what is Meatball? Meatball is, a, is an effect. So Meatball compared to, say, oh, you're, you're Big, Muff. Big Muff. Big Muff, oh, uh, Big Muff is But Larry Mullen makes his job as simple as possible. You don't do those big drum solos? I don't do drum solos, that's very simple and, and straightforward. But because I'm not, a, um, I'm not that good, um, I've got to concentrate quite hard. <laughs> so um, there are moments where I look like I'm in excruciating pain. Mullen and Clayton focus on creating the engine that drives the music. Bono and Edge are the navigators trying to take each song and each concert to new heights every night. This is where the band's two worlds collide. Their global fame has given Bono a political voice. U2's politics give their music a little something extra. When it's all said and done, do you think that you two will be remembered as one of the, the great rock bands of the era or one of the more important rock bands of the era? You know, actually, oddly enough, I think my work, uh, the activism, will be forgotten. Um, and I hope it will, because I hope those problems will have gone away. But our music will be here in 50 years and 100 years' time. Our songs occupy an emotional terrain that didn't exist before our group did. Yeah.